so this video is going to be about meditation. I've gotten tons of emails and messages from people asking me to make a video on how to meditate. The reason why I haven't gotten around to it is because I don't think I'm in a position to teach or preach about meditation because I'm just beginning to scratch the surface myself. But at the same time, I think it's important to just document whatever point, whatever particular point you are in the journey uh, as a form of self-reflection, to, just to get feedback. You, know, you don't have to look like Jeff Saito or Matt Ogas to start making videos about your training methods and, and things like that. I've made videos about training when I was 140 pounds, when I was dirty bulking, when I didn't know what I was doing, but all it's all part of the process. Now I'll move on to a mindfulness meditation. And okay, the the way that TM makes my brain feels and the way mindfulness makes my brain feels is actually a little bit different. For TM, as, as I said, it the mantra is sort of this vehicle that drives you deeper and deeper into your subconsciousness, deeper into your mind. And you sort of go into this trance-like dream state. And if I had to make the distinction, I'll say that TM activates or, or stirs part of my brain that deals with uh, creative imagination. Uh, the reason why I came to this conclusion is because whenever I do TM at night, I always have like really crazy and vivid, sometimes lucid dreams. And if I do it in the daytime, I'll feel you know, I'm in a flow state the whole day, not just you know calmness and stuff like that. And for mindfulness, it involves more concentration skills and I feel like it, you need to be more attentive and you need to put a little bit more effort into it. And for me, my brain feels more like I'm solving like a crossword puzzle. And for TM, you sort of, you, you, you allow yourself to be heady, to murmur the mantra and sort of spin inside your head and just feel this headspace. But for mindfulness, it's actually kind of the opposite. Instead of delve into a dream state, you come out of your head and get in touch with reality as it is. Mindfulness meditation is simply about being aware of whatever that is arising out through your consciousness. Whether it's sound, whether it's smell, if you open your eyes, you don't have to close your eyes by the way, sight or whatever it is that goes on through your mind. You're simply taking note, taking mental note and just noticing what you notice. It's, it's a process that's very meta. You're constantly zooming out and, and detaching yourself from, again, whatever that's arising through your consciousness and, and through your awareness. Now, there are steps that I take during my mindful uh, session. Those steps are not necessary. They're not rules. They're just, they help me sort of delve into my session easier, sort of like warming up and step by step going to the max effort squat. Everybody has a different order of things that they do to feel comfortable, whatever it feels more natural to you. But those are the steps that I take. The first thing that I do is I just sit comfortably. Uh, some people swear by postures. They think you have to do this and, and straighten your spine and, and get into lotus positions. But I, I think I don't think that's, that's necessarily as long as you're not laying down and falling asleep. Some people do it laying down, actually, if you, if you have back problems. But I, I do find it a lot more I can get into it a lot easier if I, if I just sit on a, on a chair uh, with my back against it. <clears throat> whatever comes naturally to you. The, see, the thing about meditation is that whatever feels natural, whatever, feel, whatever feels easy, that's the way you should go for. Um, the first thing that I do is I pay attention to the physical senses where I am situated in my immediate environment. And if I'm sitting in this chair right now, I direct my awareness to the sole of my feet as it touches the ground. You know, I, I, I pay attention, I become mindful of how my feet feels against the ground. And, or uh, if my hands are you know, on this chair here, I would be mindful and be aware of how my hand feels against you know, this metal handle here 
and my butt is you know, pressing against the cushion of the chair and you know, I just sort of scan my body throughout. The next thing that I become aware of is the sound that's arising through my awareness. So if I'm sitting here in my yard, I can hear birds chirping. I can hear the wind blowing. Um, I can feel uh, my neighbor over there next door uh, cutting his, his grass. So all that becomes part of my meditation. And what you do is you simply listen. By listening, I don't mean like a deliberate effort of really trying to hear each and every sound that comes into you. Just sit back and let the sound come to you. And after sitting here for a while, I would start to feel like the line, the separation between me, myself, and the world becoming thinner and thinner. And that is really sort of the, the basics of a mindfulness meditation is that you're trying to dissolve boundaries. You're trying to erase dualities and dichotomies. See, after a while, the birds are chirping. And at first, you subjectively make the distinction between yourself and the bird. Here's me, the hearer, and there's the birds. And after a while, you just sort of, you're sort of weaving yourself into the world while at the same time, simultaneously, weaving the world to you in a circular feedback loop. And the deeper that you go, the more you feel like there is no distinction between the self and the world. You feel like there's only the bird, there's only chirping. There's not the bird, there's not Frank Yang. There's the, the process of chirping and the process of wind blowing, right? And um, the next thing that I pay attention to is my breath. So you sort of go inward. You start with your body, you start with physical sensations and audio sensations. And like, you don't have to close your eyes even. Like I close my eyes. Most people close their eyes. But if you don't close your eyes, you can pay attention or be aware of visual stimuli, so like the sun and whatever you're looking at. So those are physical and perceptual stimuli that you're becoming aware of. Then you sort of go inward now. And the next thing I, I become aware of or become mindful of is my, my breath. Now, I want to say something about uh, the act of the process of breathing. See, a lot of people swear by the breath. They think that breathing is the most essential part of the core of your meditation. I mean, you can. You, you, for, for a lot of beginners, a lot of meditative uh, meditation teachers, um, uh, for starters, just tell their, uh, the students to count their breaths and for like half an hour, just one, two, three, four, up to 10, and then start over. That's a really good way to start. But I tend to agree with Sam Harris that there's nothing magical about the breath. The breath is just an entry point for you to sort of, uh, sort of an insurgent point for, you, for your awareness to be directed at the, the right plane, so to speak, so you can you know, get in touch with, with reality and get out of your head and become mindful. But I think counting your breath the whole session is kind of boring. I, I like to you know, examine other things too. Like I'll get into it later. Your thoughts, your feelings, and the sounds around you and stuff like that. The reason why a lot of people emphasize on the breath is because breathing, the, the process of breathing is both voluntary and involuntary. It's both unconscious and conscious. If I'm not conscious of the fact that I'm breathing, then the breathing is doing me. Do you know what I'm saying? But if I, once I become conscious of it, then I can sort of control it. I'm still breathing. I can never not stop breathing. But the moment that I become mindful of my breaths, then in a way I'm creating the breath instead of letting it create me. See, that's one of the things about mindfulness is that you're bringing to awareness, you're making conscious of whatever process 
that is going on inside your body or around you that you usually are unconscious of. So what I like to do when I cover my breath with the awareness is just to pay attention to that, that gap between the exhale and the inhale and really focus on the length of the breath and how long is this breath, this inhale versus the exhale. How is this particular breath that I take different from the next one? Because every breath you take is different, but you don't notice it. After breathing, I move into my mind. I go even deeper into the more abstract arena, which is my thought and my feelings. Thought and feels are this, uh, under the, uh, the same package for me when I do my meditation. It's this, it's this, it comes from the same fabric. The first time that I tried to do mindful meditation, because I got really horny, and, and you know, I my friend told me to just witness that sensation of horniness. And once you witness that, instead of you being the horniness itself, being controlled by the urge, you're detaching yourself from that feeling, and you're in that space where the, the real you, or the, aka truth, is activated. And then, at that point, at that space, you are in control of your urges, in a, in a sense. More, at least, you're witnessing it. You're acknowledging it. And I had no idea how to do it, because I was so embedded, I was so ingrained in my horniness and, and my sexual thoughts and everything in my mind that I had no idea that there's another dimension outside of your thoughts and feels that you can access. In other words, I was so contained by my mind and I was a slave to my mind my whole life until that moment where I had to step back and take charge and be the driver in the driver's seat that's taking my mind for a ride and driving it to wherever the hell I want it to be instead of letting it control me. So you move into your mind, you start to take note of your thoughts. You start to just become aware of anything that arises out of your thoughts. Because, the, okay, there's no distinction really from the inside between breaths, physical sensations, audio, the bird stripping, or me thinking about the birds, or me thinking about what I'm gonna have for dinner. All those things should be weaving into the same fabric. And because they all arise out of the same space in consciousness. The consciousness is one. There's not this, it, it's, it's not quantifiable because it's, it, the quality of consciousness is uh, homogeneous, meaning that it's one and the same. That's why Buddha's mom, Zen Buddha said, when you get into that space of, of pure consciousness, you are one with the universe. So from the perspective of your consciousness, everything arises in the same space and if you can wrap your head around that you're in a good position to mindfully meditate now the the, the key thing here is just like tm the, the two kind of meditation overlaps so I, I i don't want to make a huge distinction between the two sometimes i mix them together but some people think you should, don't think you should do that some people swear by methods but it, it, meditation is very subjective. You should test it out and however you feel like it's comfortable to you, whatever is working for you, it's, it's a process of trial and error for you. It's for you to find out about how your mind works and how, who you are in a sense. So, but for me, the, 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 the similarity, the, the overlapping point is that you should never try to change anything or suppress anything. You should accept things as they are. What, all you're doing in mindful meditation is just becoming aware. You're, you're taking mental notes. You're, noticing things, becoming aware, without trying to change things or suppress things. For, for a TM, it's going back to a mantra no matter what happens, right? And the, the funny thing about this process is that you're, you're beginning to know that, to notice that the awareness, let's say you're really bored, and, okay, I can't even stand it, I don't want to meditate anymore. But the awareness of boredom is not the same as the feeling of boredom itself. The feeling that you have of, oh, I'm bored, I'm horny. That's not quote unquote the real you. You think that's the real you because you've been identifying your whole life with that feeling. You think your mind and your, your feelings are everything that is arising out of you. You think that's you until you move 
onto that extra dimension surrounding those thoughts. Just think of mindful meditation as constantly holding up a mirror to whatever feelings or thoughts that are arising and just watch how that feeling or that thought just start to dissipate and dissolve. Somebody asked me one, one time, if you're a mirror, then if you reflect on yourself, what do you see? The, 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 the answer is the ultimate space, the ultimate Brahman, aka God, aka consciousness, the, 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 the ultimate the great boy. It's that infinite, vast spaciousness of perfect nothingness where all else arises from. It in itself is formless, but all other forms arise from it. And I always look at human minds as a way for which the universe can come to know itself. In a way, the meditative state really is the pinnacle of that, isn't it? Now, let me talk about perception a little bit. See, after a while, after sitting here for a while, being aware of all those different sensations that are arising, I start to feel as if I'm creating the sensations. Just like the fact that once you become aware of your breath, you feel like you're in control of it. Sometimes I'll feel, pay attention to the sound that's going on around me and I'll get to a point where I feel like I'm creating those sounds. Like if I heard the bird chipping, I feel like the birds are actually part of my imagination in a way that I'm I'm thinking it out instead of it's just a sound coming into my brain. I am actually feel like I'm constructing um, the, all the imagery, all the sounds that's appearing in my mind. And that's really why the Buddhists say when you become enlightened, or when you get into a meditative state, you are everything but nothing in this at the same time. Because there's, you basically raise the dichotomy between yourself and the world. And the act of perception really, from the scientific point of view, is really an act, an active act of construction, not a passive one. Whenever you're looking out into the world, it's not like you're just looking at, a, at reality as it is. It's more like you're stitching up an itching or, or painting a picture, right? It's, it's an, sort of a, a feedback, a process where it's a constructive one. Which means that everything, including pure perceptions, like just seeing this object in front of me, is a creative act that you are always involved in. So just by being in the world, just by me situating myself in the world, and observing my surrounding, I'm giving rise to it and in a circular way that it's creating me. It's really hard to explain, but I think you know what I mean. So that really is just the basis of mindfulness meditation. One visualization technique that I like to use is to imagine my awareness of my consciousness as being a frog and it's it's always been alert to whatever stimuli or whatever thoughts are arising and i'm they're like flies the the thoughts or the the, the sensations or the feelings that are arising are like my food they're like flies that i try to try to grab on try to engulf yeah what happens when you eat something it becomes part of you right And the thing about mindful meditation is that it should be done actively even when you're not meditating. See, this is the problem that I'm trying to work on right now for, for myself. So I will sit down and meditate for usually half an hour to an hour. And you, I, for beginners, I will say just sit down for 10 minutes. 10 minutes is quite, quite, a, quite a long time and, and you can get pretty, pretty deep into it just by sitting here for 10 minutes. And I, sorry, I hate using the word deep because you shouldn't be attached to states. You shouldn't be like, okay, this, I had a good meditation session. And I went really deep. And the next time you're going to be attached to that, it becomes another desire. You're going to want to go back to that state. But every meditation is different. Every second of your life is a different meditative 
experience. So you shouldn't I, I, you shouldn't say the word use the word deep or whatever to to describe your to sort of judge your meditation state because there is no such thing as a good meditator or uh, a good meditative session. Anyways, so what I mean is that if you can't carry over your meditation to real life, then it's pretty much pointless. So like I'll be sitting here, I'll, I'll feel like, okay, I meditated. And then when I go on to the world, real world and interact with my environment real time, I'll feel like I go back to my old thinking patterns again. And that's the thing I'm trying to work on right now. And one fable that I came across recently that really helped me is this. This day master that said there are six billion distinct moments in time where each moment is an invitation or an opportunity for you to change your life around. And he said that the, the number doesn't really matter. I don't know how, what the exact number is, but the message is the same. Even in a snap of a finger, he said, there are 64 little moments. Just something as quick as a snap of a finger. There are 64 nano moments where you can wake yourself up from. So that's why people you know, tell you to snap out of it and they snap your finger. Every time I lost track, I would think about this and I would, boom, feel refreshed. I, I would sort of realign myself again to the truth. Now, see this is a really powerful analogy because thinking, now one, let me take a note, make a mental note about thinking before I go on. Thinking is not bad in and of itself. It's the judgment or the labels that you put on thinking that's bad. It's, it's the fact that you're not aware of the fact that you're thinking that is quote unquote bad. I think the mind is every human being's ultimate choice of drug. People are addicted to thinking, especially thinking about negative thoughts or thoughts that are just completely bullshit or useless. Think about the past, about the future, now that it's real. And we go into this cycle of thought where you spiral you inwardly into this act of almost like an act of debauchery. It's almost like I, sometimes when I'm thinking, I would feel like I'm actually binging on alcohol or eating junk food or watching porn because it's just as addictive and just as destructive. But unlike physical endeavors like eating pizza where you can actually get fat or you should fuck a girl without a condom, oh shit, this is the moment where I can wake up from. I can change my life now, but boom, you fucked. You already caught AIDS. But with thoughts, they're by nature immaterial. So you can at any given moment sort of give your mind a, a clean and fresh slate and pick up right when you left off. So, see, every time I do this, I'll be thinking, thinking, boom, I'm thinking. Just that acknowledgement of the fact that you're thinking immediately puts you into that, ejects you out from this container of yourself into that space of, of holiness. And I will literally, whenever I do this, feel an electric shock run into my body and my world suddenly becomes brighter and more clear. It's, it's amazing. And what is enlightenment? That's the ultimate question, right? Because you can't talk about meditation without associating to enlightenment. Maybe there's a permanent state of being enlightened that is so distinct that it really, literally, makes a difference between darkness and flip on a light switch, maybe. But if you look at enlightenment as something that's like a godly goal that's up there in high up in the mountains that you actually have to renounce the world and climb up to grab after meditating for 20 years in a cave, then you will never get it. Because that mindset, that obsessive mindset about in making enlightenment something that's so grain to it actually is anti-enlightenment itself. So, 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 so it's a paradox. It just becomes another egoic uh, desire, another quote unquote goal. What I've becoming to view enlightenment is that it's a moment by moment process of renewal, of detachment, of, of just becoming aware moment by moment. And I think it's every human being's birthright to be enlightened. I think everybody is born 
in a way enlightened. Babies are enlightened because there is no concepts that is trapping their minds. There is no, there's no dichotomy. There's no duality inside a baby. The baby flows seamlessly within its environment, just like animals do. Um, so I think every moment is there for you to grab onto that jewel inside you. So enlightenment is more like stripping away, isn't it? Like subtracting. You're stripping away all this bullshit until the core self comes out. And that core self is, the good news is that it's inside each one of us already. You just have to be aware moment by moment to at least, if not attain it permanently, at least align yourself onto the right path. You don't get it somewhere 10 years, 15 years down the line, like all of all the goals. You can get it right here in the here and now. I, I don't know, maybe those little moments adds up and, and boom, suddenly something flips and you tip over, like this tipping point, or boom, something happens into, into your brain and you, I, I don't want to talk about things that I don't know. So why don't you tell me what you think?